activated virus defenses. Prepare to download. Welcome. Hello, this is Martin McKay. And this is Chris John Riley. And we would like to welcome you to the official podcast for the 30th Annual FIRST Conference being held in Kuala Lumpur, June 24th through 29th, 2018. For more information, go to www.first.org. And now we join our interview in progress. This time on the show, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Alex Mastretti, Manager for Netflix Security Intelligence Response Team, and Swathi Joshi, a Technical Program Manager for the team. Welcome to the show, folks. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's really good to be talking to you. I, I know when the, the program came out, this was one of the talks that I was really interested in kind of diving into and definitely attending at the conference. Maybe you can kind of give the, the people who are listening a little bit of a rundown about what you're going to be talking about at the conference. Certainly. Uh, so our talk is is focused around this idea of a learning security organization uh, that's really borrowing heavily from Peter Seng's work in the fifth discipline. And it's looking at, at incident response as, uh, as an engine to drive learning about security back in the organization. So we look at, um, you know, best practices like post-incident reviews, um, simulations, red teams, things like that as opportunities to really learn about security and, and constantly adapt to the adversary who is also out there constantly adapting. So within that framework, we hang on various um, you know, other concepts that we're playing with and, and just want to sort of get out there and, and get feedback on. Right. And as you know, Netflix continues to grow its business and operations, we recognize that there are different types of incidents that we would likely lead. So we are also working on a Netflix-wide crisis management framework, um, and we are, we are sort of hoping to talk about that as well. So you mentioned in the the abstract for your talk a bit about chaos engineering. Perhaps for people who are listening to the podcast who aren't aware of that and maybe how how that came into being, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that plays a part. So chaos engineering comes out of our our software reliability engineering group. Uh, It's one of the key ways that we keep the, the service stable. And the idea there is that you inject chaos into your system live in production uh, to make sure that you can recover from that. So I think our most well-known product in the space is called um, Chaos Monkey, uh, and that's a service that goes through our our instances in AWS and just randomly turns them off. So if your system is built in a robust and scalable way, uh, even having one instance be turned off is not a big deal. The auto-scaling group will recognize that, spin up a new instance, no impact to customers or any of our reliability metrics. So we were hoping to apply that same successful uh, paradigm to security, and that would be by injecting security attack simulations at random across our our infrastructure. So it's early days yet for us there, but we're looking at some of the the sort of atomic red team testing uh, concepts and developing red team simulations that we can deploy automatically into production uh, to test both our detection uh, as well as letting it run all the way through to response to see end-to-end how we handle um, instance at that scale. It sounds interesting, certainly the, the replaying of, of red team style activities on the network. Uh, do you find that that puts kind of a, a load on the incident response team or do you find that that kind of evens out over, over a time and allows you to kind of improve your processes and streamline and automate things? It's certainly something that you want to tune for. Um, not every simulated attack has to go all the way through to human eyes. Uh, If you're just testing your detection pipelines, then that can be picked up and automatically correlated against your detection engine uh, and simply, you know, suppressed at that time. So you can really, you can dial up, maybe you're having a slow week of on-call and you want to get some some practice cycles in. Uh, You can basically, you know, flag yourself as available and we can push some simulations through to you. Um, But there's no, um, you know, there's no requirement that these things be hitting you in the middle of, uh, of another incident or something like that. And piggybacking on that, um, another way to look at it is, you know, wartime versus peacetime approach. So, you know, like Alex said, if it's a if it's a slow on call, if you've scheduled some simulations during peacetime, you're sort of preparing yourself um, for a possible future uh, scenario, right? So, 
companies that have an incident response plan, um, it's really important for uh, um, for us to sort of test it with an experienced team and find the impact that way we can reduce uh, the impact of the crisis um, in the future. I can I can really uh, appreciate that uh, doing these kind of scenarios helps you pick out those individual cases where maybe logging isn't as deep as you would want, the alerting isn't is, isn't uh, as accurate as you'd need, and, and kind of helps you to improve the process overall in a in a constant feedback loop. That's exactly right. A lot of sort of learning and actions come out of these tabletops um, and game dates, which help us get to a better so program maturity um, for the response team. Yeah, it's it's very interesting to see. I mean, and I've been involved with with red teams for a, for a while now and at various different companies, and there is very different mentalities across the board. Some even going to the point uh, of saying that red team and blue team should never talk together um, and be completely separate entities. And it's nice to see that that people are realizing that that shouldn't be the case, and and kind of trying to bring these teams together into a more coherent uh, kind of plan. Um, you mentioned a little in your abstract that. Um, using incident response in a, in a fully SaaS world was, was something you wanted to touch on. Uh, I can understand that being something that takes a little bit of additional planning. Maybe you could dive into that and maybe talk to some of the issues that, that you're seeing in that space. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting space. Uh, when we go out and talk to our peers, a lot of the sort of prior art in the incident response world is, is around you know, Windows machines on Active Directory domains in permissive network environments. Um, you know, or traditional data centers with multi-purpose servers that are, you know, that's both serving as your mail server and your web server, and it has, you know, user shells on it. So there's some fairly different um, attacker techniques and so sort of defensive techniques that, that emerge when you're, when you're in this world of, you know, being in AWS in a public cloud and moving most of your corporate services into the SaaS model. So it's been fun to figure out how to operate there, and it's been fun to try and find other folks in the space to... Um, sort of share techniques back and forth. So, I mean, you know, specific examples would be sort of, say, you know, we're a G Suite company, so, you know, all of our mail, all of our documents, all of that stuff lives in, in the Google Cloud. Um, so when you're, you know, sort of debugging a, an intrusion in that in that space, there's a whole other layer of permissions models and attack surfaces that, you know, maybe you've gotten rid of a lot of attack surface from your, your Windows boxes on AD, but now you've got this new third-party integrations attack surface, and you've got new permissions models for, for G Suite uh, documents that you have to figure out how to deal with in a, in a different way. So it's sort of applying the, the traditional skills that you had before, but on this new environment, which I think is a, is a fun, fun challenge. Now, I, I know earlier you mentioned uh, AWS as well. Um, how have you seen the, the maturity of kind of cloud platforms, AWS, Google Cloud, as you are uh, over kind of the, the time period where you've been using them? I know that some of those cloud services may have had uh, less immature um, incident response and logging features. Has that now caught up pace with um, enterprise requirements, or are you still looking at large gaps in some of those areas? So I can only really speak to AWS. I haven't really done much in the other cloud providers. Um, and I've been at Netflix for a little over two years. So that's sort of the, you know, the range of my experience. But I would say AWS, you know, First, you have to understand the shared responsibility model, right? AWS is taking care of the infrastructure layer, and the logging they provide from that in the, in the manner of CloudTrail and CloudWatch is quite good. Um, you're still responsible for logging above that infrastructure layer. So the telemetry that you get off your instances is still something that you need to, to figure out yourself. But um, yeah, I, I would say the, the level of detail in the CloudTrail logs is quite good. Um, of course, you know we could always get them faster, um, it's always a challenge to stay on top of them as they as they they're adding services so quickly. There's all these new formats to keep on top of. So there's a lot of you know reading documentation, which fortunately is quite good, uh, and keeping up your your knowledge of that space. But the um, the primitives are, are quite impressive in terms of what they can get you. Now you also mentioned um, regarding spinning up um, read-only instances in in AWS. Um, is that microservices you know, spinning up? short-term jobs in, in AWS and then tearing them down just for single specific jobs? Yeah, the, the goal that we're working towards is immutable and ephemeral instances. So immutable meaning that they are built from source. Uh, in our case, we, we have a build pipeline that creates AMIs, base images. Uh, and then when we build a, 
a security um, or when we build an auto scaling group, we'll just simply stamp out many, many copies of that same base AMI, that same VM image. So in that case, there shouldn't be a lot of post configuration scripts running. Uh, all that configuration should be baked into your AMI. So if that's the case, you end up with a very strong baseline, uh, both from a detection and a forensics perspective. Um, so you can use that baseline to see any changes or, you know, at some point we'll be able to simply lock it down so that, uh, you know, we're already making more and more partitions or more and more uh, paths on the disk read only. You get to the point where, you know, you're basically you're writing to the, the temp file system in memory, but you're not making any changes on disk. Uh, and then you've got a very, a very strong security posture. So we're not there yet. Some other folks are further ahead with, you know, have different threat models, but um, that's definitely the goal. And then the ephemerality helps too, right? These things come and go very quickly. Hopefully, you know, it used to be that you would you would look at mean time, mean uptime across your fleet and try and get that to be longer and longer. We want the opposite now. We want shorter and shorter lived instances. So, you know, if it's on the order of days, that's good. If it's on the order of hours, even better. Um, and then you get into sort of the the function of the service world and you've got things that are only lasting for minutes or even seconds to, to get a job done and then they, they destroy themselves and move on. And from a program maturity standpoint, um, the digital forensics and the incident response program, we want to sort of automate routine aspects of like, you know, there is data collection, analysis, um, containment throughout the incident response cycle. Any kind of ad hoc and complex requirements that come up, we, we want to automate those and um, reduce, um, reduce the time to close an incident. So that's our goal. I guess this feeds quite well into to the the identity as the the new perimeter um, point that that you were making in your um, your abstract as well. If you're spinning up multiple instances, you you never know quite what's spinning up at any one time. As you as you you don't really need to know if it's spinning up one instance or ten, depending on load. It, it's obviously very hard to tell exactly where all of your infrastructure sits at any one time, which I guess is where the identity side fits in. Yeah, I think the the concept of identity as a perimeter applies applies both to the corporate and and the production spaces. Um, if you think about it in, the, in terms of corporate, it's basically, you know, we're not trying to have uh, a trusted network. We we have this Lisa model where we consider all of our corporate networks untrusted. You basically get a pipe out to the internet, but you can't move laterally. Uh, between that and not having Active Directory, you know, you've you've limited your attack surface from sort of the standard attacker playbooks of landing on a, a endpoint. You know, Mimi catching the admin creds moving laterally or trying to use like an eternal blue to move laterally. So none of that happens. Where we do have our control points are on the identity. So you need to essentially, to, do, to get anything of, of value from our system, you need to touch one of our SaaS services. And at that identity layer, whether it's through an identity proxy or through our VPN, which has you know, identity as, as the sort of gatekeeper there, um, that's where we try and establish that control point. That's where we look for anomalies. Um, and that's really sort of our, our primary line of defense. So that, of course, applies into the production space as well, right? If you're going to, ideally, we're working with immutable instances here, so you shouldn't need to log in interactively. But if you're touching any of our build tools or making changes to source, obviously your identity is what's allowing you to do that. So it really becomes key to, to all the security. The focus on the identity parameters is also to leverage any kind of identity data to do you know, better detection. Um, throughout the identity lifecycle, whatever events we can get, logins, um, any admin events, any kind of configurations. And then we sort of put that into a data warehouse and do analytics and um, generate um, whatever specific um, events we think are um, high fidelity. Great, well, thank you very much for taking the time to, to join me, Alex and uh, Swathi. I really appreciate the discussion. I really look forward to continuing the discussion, uh, hopefully on the ground in Kuala Lumpur. Um, I'd like to, to point people who, who are interested in, in these areas and, and other areas regarding Netflix um, tech rollout and incident, incident response. Um, there is a, a blog on Medium, um, which I, I recommend people should, should take a quick look at, which is medium.com forward slash Netflix dash tech blog. And there is a, uh, a number of presentations that Netflix have given previously on jobs.netflix.com forward slash teams forward slash security. And I will definitely be spending the evening looking at those, I'm sure. So again, thank you very much for, for taking the time to chat with us. And I hope that uh, we will manage to continue the discussion in Kuala Lumpur. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. This was awesome. Yeah, this is great. See you on the ground. Bye. Computer activated virus defense. Prepare to download. Initiated the Welcome. 
You've been listening to the official podcast of the 30th Annual First Conference in Kuala Lumpur, held June 24th to the 29th, 2018. For more information, please check www.first.org. Thank you and have a good day. It's okay. Fine by me.